So we're going to continue our series entitled Killing It here in just a few moments. But before that, Pastor Jimmy's up here to join me to give you a couple more updates about some things that have happened and are also about to happen. And so That's one right. of them, um, the team that went to Poland um, is back and everybody is safe and sound. And I want to let you know that so many of you donated supplies for that. And we were sent a picture of a van being loaded that is heading into Ukraine. All of that material is already in Ukraine. That happened so quickly after the team was there. Yeah. And if you see your suitcase in there, it's not yeah. coming back. It was going one-way one way, trip. One way trip. And it is staying there. Thank you for your contribution <laughs> to the effort. And there's another way to get involved there in is. helping Ukraine. So this coming Saturday, we're doing a 5K that brings awareness and finances for the human trafficking that's happening between Poland and Ukraine. And so we're asking people to sign up. It's a walk, run bike, blade, or crawl, do whatever you think you want to do, we're okay. Crawl? Family. I can mean, you... some people do weird stuff, man. I mean, seriously. <laughs> can I roll? So, we just want you to be there, however it is, okay? It's family friendly, uh, 12 and under, you know, um, are free, so just come be part of it. Food trucks at night, right afterwards, and we have a big concert happening right after it as well. But there's something going on Sunday morning too. Yeah, so be sure to mark your calendars for the night of worship. So that's right after the 5K yep. um, beginning uh, there from five to seven. And then on Sunday, 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 next week, we're gonna have one service and it's not starting at this time. It's not starting at the other time of the earlier service. One service at 10 a.m. So be sure to mark your calendars and the weather forecast looks a lot better than today. And so we're gonna have a great yeah. time outside. We'd love for you to be there, but all of that weekend is really a great opportunity to invite somebody to join you as well. It's fun. We got a big stage. Bring your lawn chairs, bring your coolers. Um, I'll go through your coolers when I walk through, find out who's got the best stuff, okay? It's just going to be a great will. time. It, it will. will. So yeah. hope to see you next week, both days. Okay, right, I'm going to crawl off the Jimmy. stage now. So let's turn our attention to the message for today. And what we're looking at in this series are these issues that really are common to all of humanity. These are things that we can all identify with in one way or another, and these are potential barriers to us discovering more of the life that God has for us. And I think in one way or another, everybody can identify with the reality of guilt and shame. And here's where, you know, some of this idea comes from. Here's just one example in the book of Romans chapter 8. For if you live according to the flesh, and the flesh is kind of weird, what does that mean? And it's referring to more than just, you know, the human body. Whenever you see that in the Bible, it's referring really to our nature. That there's something in the very nature of humanity where it says, and if you live according to the flesh, to your nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death, killing it, the deeds of the body, you will live. And so here's what we're doing in these weeks is we're trying to kill some of those things that are a reality in the human experience. And guilt and shame are certainly a major component of that. Let's talk first about what are guilt and shame and the difference between those and also the connection between those as well because it's helpful for our understanding. So first comes guilt. Guilt is I did bad. I made a decision. I took an action and it was the wrong thing. Should not have done it. And I know that you've experienced the same thing that I have. As much as you regret that and wish you could do it over, you can't. Once it's out there, it's out there and you cannot undo what you have already done. And we may think, well, guilt is only bad, right? Because it feels like this heavy weight. But I got to tell you, in the Bible, there are actually times when guilt can produce a positive result. Um, guilt is not always bad. There's a healthy form of guilt. Well, what is that? Guilt can be like that light that goes on on your dashboard, 
And might I recommend, I've heard, you know, a lot of people get out a piece of tape and cover over that light when it comes on, right? It's there for a purpose. It's telling us there's something that needs attention. There's something that's not right. There's something that needs to be replaced and a new piece put in there. There's something going on. And guilt can be like that morning light that alerts us that something needs change. And the Bible talks about it in these terms. Here's one example in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. For godly grief, what is that? Godly grief produces a repentance. What is repentance? That is a word that pictures turning around and going in the opposite direction. It's like doing a 180. It's not continuing in the same direction. It's a change of direction, a change for the better. That a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Wouldn't that be great? to live without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So there is a positive way in which guilt can actually lead us forward when it produces the kind of change that takes us in the direction that God has for us. What is the biblical word for that? The Bible word for healthy guilt um, is conviction. And conviction is this sense that, you know what, something needs to change. Something needs to go in a different direction than it has. And I would just say this, God is about conviction. He's not about condemnation. Condemnation is there is no hope for you, that you've done too much, you can never recover, you can never undo it, and there is no hope for you. Conviction is let's go in a different direction. Let's turn and move in a direction that is different. So guilt is I did bad. Well, what is shame? Shame is I am bad. So now we've moved from something that we have done. Now it crosses the line into who I am and what makes me a person. And there is nothing but condemnation in this condition called shame. And shame, maybe if we put it in these terms, is guilt that has never been dealt with, guilt that has never been addressed, a change that has never been made. That shame, in one respect, could be guilt that has passed its expiration date. You ever gone into the fridge and there's something that's passed its expiration date? And this is a, a, a thing that mystifies me. This sometimes happens up in our break room where somebody goes, this says 1998 on it, you know, does this smell bad? It's like, why do we make people smell stuff that is way past its expiration date? We know better than that. But shame is a little bit like that but it brings with it a whole lot of condemnation. And what it does is blur the line between what I did and who I am. So guilt is I blew up at my kids. It was over the top. It was too much reaction for what was done. Shame is I'm a horrible parent and I will never get this right. Guilt is I relapsed into an addiction. Shame is, I'm a loser at life, and I will never overcome this. One is about what I did. The other is a statement about who I am. And when those lines get blurred down the road of shame, there is nothing but condemnation. So what is the way forward with all of this? How do we find our way through this and out of this and make that turn in the direction that God has for us? Well, the reality of guilt and shame has been a part of the human experience from the very beginning. And I mean the very beginning, even at the beginning of the Bible. And maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but the Bible paints it this way, that God made everything that there is. And when he created the world, he created a pristine and perfect world. And there was even a garden called the Garden of Eden. And inside of that garden, he placed a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, and they had everything at their disposal. They had everything that they needed and then some. And what did it look like? There have been some attempts to picture what it must have been like, but I got to tell you, it was spectacular. It was beautiful. And God says, enjoy it. It's yours. And all of it is there for you to enjoy. And God gave all that was needed and more.
But then also, and this is, you know, sometimes where people get a little bit of a question and maybe a little bit hung up, because one of the things that God says is there is a tree, it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he says, don't eat from the fruit of that tree. Now, why would God do that? Why would he create a perfect world and everything in its place and everything proper and everything right and then say, well, but you know what? If you go here, there's going to be an issue. Why would he do that? Because a relationship, because love involves a choice. And so God gave a choice. And it could have been anything that God put off limits, but there was this opportunity to honor God, to respect God, to follow him, to believe that he has their best interests at heart, or there was the choice to go in their own direction, to be their own gods, to decide, you know what, we'd be a little bit more like God if we did the very thing that God told us was off limits. And God was pretty clear about all of it too. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you, so, you shall surely die. Is God vague? Is this mysterious? It's pretty clear, right? And God says, look, 99.9% .9 of everything that you see is for you to enjoy, to experience. You know, just, it's for you. But there's this one thing. And really, it's more about Will we believe that God is for us? Or will we believe that there's something even better outside of the one boundary that God has given? And the description of the man and woman in this pristine, perfect environment is incredible. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now that's an interesting description, right? Why that? Why not they were joyful and they were fulfilled? They were happy and they were content. <laughs> But instead, it talks about naked and not ashamed, no shame. And I think we have to understand, naked is not just about a clothing thing, that it's talking about vulnerability, that it's talking about being understood in everything that we are inside and out, that there is nothing hidden. There's no pretense, there's no manipulation. It's just what you see is what you get in all of the right ways. And so that was their experience. But along comes temptation. And the temptation to make a choice. And God has an adversary who wants to lead them outside of the boundaries of God. And so there's that one tree. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Something just dramatically changed. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so now they're going to cover up and they're going to hide a little bit more because all of a sudden something has been changed and changed not for the better. And not only is it their relationship with each other that has changed, the relationship with God changed as well. It goes on to say, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Whereas before everything was out in the open, now they're hiding. Now they're taking refuge. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now let's get something really clear about when God asks a question. He's not looking for information. God already knows where they are. So why would God ask the question? Why wouldn't he just go over and, you know, kind of move the bush aside and go, there you are, hiding behind the bush? <laughs> it's because this is another choice. It's another opportunity. Will they come clean? Will they be honest? Will they come out from their place of hiding? Or will they stay hidden Will they shade the truth and the reality of what has just happened? Where are you? God already knows where they are, but it's a choice for them. And he said, this is Adam speaking now, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. 
And so God hears where I am and why I am where I am because something has drastically changed. And then God asks another question. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I've commanded you not to eat? Again, God already knows what happened. Why is he going to ask them this question? It's another opportunity. It's another choice. Will they be honest? Will they come clean? Will they come out of hiding? Or are they going to manipulate it? Are they going to shade it? And the response that is given, it would be comical if it were not so re- real back then and also today. The man said, now get this, the woman <laughs> that you gave me, it's pretty obvious what he's doing, right? That you gave, you know, with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. It's everybody's fault, but not mine. (laughs) That ever happened in this world since that moment in time? And ladies, lest you think, well, yeah, that's what guys do. Here's uh, your experience. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is is that you have done? Here's an opportunity. Here's a choice. The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And somebody commented on this and said, this set in motion um, a paradigm that has been playing out ever since, that every husband blames his wife and every wife says, the devil made me do it. (laughs) But this whole shading and not being real and hiding themselves away, this is our experience, isn't it? It's the way it's been from the very beginning. And all along this story and so many other times, there is a God, a holy God, who already knows the truth, the reality about us, what we have done, what we have decided, what we regret, what leads us to feel shame. And he asks us, where are you? And what have you done? And who told you? It's not because he's looking for information. He's looking for people to come clean, to come out of hiding, to be honest. And we think, yeah, but if we say the truth and the thing that I know on some level, I wish I could do it differently than I did and I wish I could make a different decision, but I can't because I know it's already done. Where does that leave me? And what happens on the other side of this moment is an incredible picture of the heart of God, the nature of God, the character of God. Because remember, this world was perfect. It was pristine. And this world had never experienced death. Now God said, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And it's set in motion their eventual um, uh, movement toward their own death. Didn't happen immediately, but it was going to happen. But the world that God had created had never seen it until this moment, right on the other side of that exchange. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Where did that come from? God goes out into his perfect creation, finds an animal of some kind. We don't know what kind it was. And he kills it and takes the skin off it and uses it to cover the shame of the people who have stepped outside of the boundaries of God the innocent, sacrificed in the place and to cover the guilty. And God's heart on the other side of that is something that I think we wrestle with because maybe at the end of the day we think, you know what, when it comes to the reality of the things that I've done and the decisions that I've made, I mean, it's up to me. Either I've got to, you know, find a different place to to put the blame for that or I've got to work that off or I've got to make sure that I do more good things rather than that because I know that there are things that I have done that are on that negative side of that scale if there is a scale. But that's not what we see pictured in this moment or any other moment after it. And here's often what we think is that I sin and you know what? And I've made mistakes, and sin is just an archery term that means to miss the mark, to miss the bullseye. And I think we all know what that's like. But I am not my sin. And that's where we often get confused. Because we can think, you know what? I'm just that person who has made those mistakes. And that's all I'll ever be. 
And I can work to undo that, but the only resources at my disposal are me, myself, and I. It could maybe be the thing that was done to me. And I got to tell you, there are a number of times I've sat with people who are abused as children. And it has led to decades of carrying shame for things that were not one iota their responsibility. It was done to them, not by them. And yet the weight of that can be crushing. But we often get those things very mixed up and very jumbled. And so we live in a world that many times the message goes, you know, something like this, shame on you. And I think we experience that a little bit more right now in our culture than we ever have, at least in my lifetime. Why is it that we are so anxious and so quick to do this? Could it be that maybe if I make you feel worse about you, somehow in a really broken way, I feel better about myself? But it really hasn't changed anything. But we live in a world where that's a very common expression. So what do we do? What do we do at a time like this? Well, remember, God shows up in that picture way back at the beginning, in that garden, and responds and invites people to come out, to come clean, to be honest. Now, here's one of the other things that we often say around Washington Heights, is that if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus. Because Jesus, being God the Son, he took on full humanity, still being fully God. And when he was here, if you want to know what God would say in the real world, just listen to the words of Jesus. What would he do? Look at the, um, the examples of what Jesus did. How would he respond? Look at how Jesus responded. Let me give you one example of that. Is it going to be the same picture that we saw from the beginning? And we're not going to look at every verse of this story. You can read it for yourself. It's found in Luke chapter 19. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he knows what's waiting for him. There's going to be a mock trial. He's going to be found guilty for blasphemy. And he's going to be tortured until he is eventually nailed to a cross and he dies. That's where he's going. And he knows that's coming. And he's on his way and he walks through a city called Jericho. And in Jericho, there is an entourage with him. Word's gotten out that he's coming, and apparently there's a huge crowd around that. And in the city of Jericho, there's a man who lives there, and his name is Zacchaeus. And if you grew up in church like I did, you used to sing a really weird song about Zacchaeus (laughs) because he's vertically challenged. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. So he climbed up high in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's in Jericho. And Zacchaeus, we are told, gets up into a tree. And part of it is about a sight line, but the other opportunity is for somebody to hide here. Why would somebody like this be hiding? Here's what it tells us about Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector, and not just any tax collector. He is the chief tax collector of that area. And we think, okay, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. If you were a tax collector, you were in league with the Roman Empire that has Israel under its thumb. Israel was really conscripted to collect taxes to fund the Roman army. And Rome said, here's the amount that we want. If you, tax collector, want to charge above and beyond that, you can do that and you can keep all the difference. And so these people became extremely wealthy at the expense and through the extortion of their own people. Maybe in our terminology, the way to feel some of the emotion that was connected with somebody who was a tax collector... This would be like somebody conspiring with the Nazis. Or maybe somebody who was helping out ISIS in a more recent day. And remember, he's not just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector, so he's in charge of all the other tax collectors in that area. This would have been the person who would have broken off every relationship with everybody around him because people hated this person. You talk about somebody who's made bad choices and has the shame of an entire community on him. It's Zacchaeus. Why would somebody do that? Because all they care about is being wealthy. And who cares about relationships 
And who cares about what anybody thinks? I'm just going to do what's going to get me ahead. And there he is, perched up in a tree. And here comes Jesus. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops. And he says to Zacchaeus these words. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus, come out. Zacchaeus, come down. Zacchaeus, come clean. And here is the same choice, the same opportunity for somebody in this broken world of ours. Because Zacchaeus could have said, Ah, no, I'm good. You just keep on going. I'm going to stay right where I am. Jesus, come on down. Come on out. Come clean. I know who you are. I know the decisions you've made. I know what everybody thinks about you in this town. Zacchaeus, come on out. He has a choice to make. What's he going to do? So he hurried and came down and received him, Jesus, joyfully. And it's not a big deal to us, but when somebody says, I'm going to come to your house, you know what it means? It means I want to have a relationship with you. It's like saying we're close, we're friends. We're in close communion with each other. And so he's not just saying, hey, you know what, Zacchaeus, you need, you know, to come you know, and be honest about who you are and all the wrong things you've ever done. This is saying, I want a relationship with you. And Zacchaeus says, yep. He comes down. He comes out. And notice what happens in the town, though. When they, all the people around in Jericho, saw it, they all, what's the next word? Grumbled. Why? He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And there's a commentator, his name is Kenneth Bailey. And he lived in the Middle East for a number of decades. And he makes a comment about this whole exchange right here. And he says, the most despised person, the person who would have received the most shame in that community, all of a sudden has been moved into second place when it comes to shame. Well, who just moved into first place? Jesus did. Because he said, I want to be in a relationship with somebody like this. And he took the shame upon himself. And took all the eyes off of Zacchaeus. And now they're on Jesus. The story goes on to tell us how Zacchaeus says, you know what? Everybody that I've taken money from, I'm going to repay them multiple times over. And Jesus says, salvation has come to this home. And let's be real clear. Salvation did not come because Zacchaeus did those things. Salvation came because there was a relationship. Because God in the flesh took on the shame of one person. And on the other side of that, he was set free. So in a world that often says, shame on you, Jesus says, shame off you. And how can he say that? Because he takes the shame on himself. And Jesus does not erase or ignore the things that we have done and the weight that we feel. Instead, Jesus says, I know all about it. But come come down, come out, come clean. And he takes it upon himself. And when he was tortured and he was nailed to that cross, he took all of that upon himself for somebody like Zacchaeus and for somebody like you and for somebody like me. The way forward is to recognize who Jesus is and the way in which he transforms these hearts and lives of ours. He knows everything about you. And he says, come down, come clean, be honest. We don't have to play the blame game. We don't have to continue to hide. We can be set free. He took it on himself. 
I'm going to invite you to bow your heads together with me. And Lord Jesus, it is amazing to realize the heart of God, knowing all that you know about us, every single one of us, not even the things that we've done, even the things that we have desired that are so far from what you have for us. You know about that too. And you invite us to come. And you, as Sally said, you bore our sins as you stood in our place and made payment for all that is ours. May we recognize that our hope is in you, in the God who loves us in that way. And so God, draw us closer to you and help us to experience more freedom from the things that might be a barrier to living the kind of life that we can experience together with you. Lead us in that direction, God, for your name's sake. We ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen.